I'm sitting because I need to, not because I'm lazy, okay? <laughs> you allow me that grace? Good deal. Ah, this has been a fun time. I, I enjoy Q&A. It's always a challenge because sometimes you ask hard questions. And we got a couple of hard questions today. And then if I get through with those, I'm just going to do popcorn questions where we can just give quick answers. And there are several of those that I think that we can do that. So let's, uh, let's get started. Oh, by the way, Christmas play is this next weekend? And we, is that right? Next weekend? So help us advertise, advertise. Word of mouth, Facebook, share, like. Anything that you can do to get people, call on the phone, offer to go pick up, bring them. Uh, this, is, this is a way that we showcase our church. It's not, it's, it's not a r- religious thing, but, it is, but we're just showing people that, uh, that we're just regular people. We're not strange. I mean, there, there's folks that think we're strange. And uh, I guess that's, that's okay, but, you know, we're really not. We're just normal day-to-day working people that love God, and, and uh, I think our community needs to see that. And we have a lot of people who come to our Christmas plays. All right, here we go. Here's, this may be the hardest question that has been submitted, and I saved it to the end. Here it is. Is evil simply the essence that remains in the absence of God, or did God create a space for evil to exist? Oh, that's an easy answer. So Terry Randall is going to come and <laughs> give us the answer. <laughs> yeah, holy smokes! I I have done research. I have uh, I have I listened to R. C. Sproul. I don't know if any if any of you know who R. C. Sproul is, and he is a uh, very learned man. Uh, he's a Calvinist, which that's okay. Uh, and he goes through 55 minutes of talking about it. And when he got through, he basically he says, where does evil come from? I don't know. And the Bible doesn't give us a lot of insight into the origin of evil. Uh, it, it just doesn't. We, we know that evil existed. Uh, and, and when we say exist, is it a... Is it a, it's not a physical thing. It manifests in, in, in the physical realm because people make choices to do evil. And there are consequences that, that, you know, Hitler was evil and he killed how many Jews? That, that, you know, that was evil. We, we know that that's evil, but it's, it's not necessarily a physical thing, but it can manifest itself in, in the physical realm. So let's, uh, let's think about this a little bit. And uh, before the world began, there was God. Okay, what do we know about God? God is good. He's love. We know a lot of things about God. But when, before God ever created anything, there was God. He was sufficient within himself. There were, you know, God has no needs. God does not need us. There's not anything that we can give to God that would add to who He is. He is just, he's just all sufficient, and He's all good. He's all good. And, and before time began, well, <laughs> before time. You know, God doesn't live in space, time, or matter. He lives outside of that. And, and I can't comprehend that in, in my peanut brain. But before he created anything, there was no evil. There is no evil whatsoever in God. Are you, are you following me? So uh, God did not create evil. How does, but how did it get here? Well, I want to give you a, a scenario. You know, the question is, is does it... Is it the essence that remains in the absence of God? You know, that's, that's something that, that could be uh, discussed in a small group. <laughs> we discuss some of these things in our men's Bible studies, and sometimes we come to a conclusion, and sometimes we just say, hey, we don't know. And, uh, 
Or did God create a space for evil to exist? Now, I, I want to address that. Two things that we know about God. He, he is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And for anything to happen in God's universe, He has to allow it to happen. He, does He have the power to keep something from happening? If you got all power, you can keep something from happening. And then the question arises, well, if God is good and God is all-powerful, then why is there evil? And, and that, you know, a lot of atheists, that is their argument against God. You know, if God is good and, and doesn't stop evil, then he's not good. If God is all, uh, supposed to be all-powerful and can't stop evil, then he's not all-powerful. Therefore, there's no God. So, you know, I, I, th I thought about this scenario, and I've listened to several people and uh, I heard something that Robbie Zachariah said that, that makes a lot of sense. And I want to address it this way. And let me just say what I'm saying is opinions. Because we do not know where evil, how it got here. I've got an opinion, okay? And I heard R.C. Sproul talk about this and he didn't like my opinion. Well, you know, and I didn't like his conclusion because he didn't give me an answer. Where does, where does it come from? We, we just don't know. We do know that evil happened before the Garden of Eden. We know that the first essence of evil that happened happened with Lucifer. And that's, that's kind of where, that's the first inkling that we had where evil took place because he rebelled against God. Uh, he took a third of the angels with him. Uh, so there was this thing that happened that, that preceded the Garden of Eden. And one of the things that God placed in the garden was the, was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now what do we know about God? God is good. There's lots of scripture that talks about how God is good. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. There is no evil in God. So for evil to be, yes, he had to make a place for it to happen. And why did he do that? And, and that's, you know, that's a big question. Why did he do that? So let's talk about four scenarios. Number one, God could have done nothing. He did not have to create the universe, the world, and... He could have existed in his, his perfect unity and been perfectly content. Like I say, he does not have lack. He does not have need. He does, he does not need our love. He does not need our fellowship. He does not need anything. He lacks nothing. He is all. He has all. And... Uh, he could, have, he could have chosen to do that, but we know that he didn't. He could have created a, a, a world in where there was no good or evil. And that would be an a, a amoral world. So anything that happened in that world could not be described as good or evil. If you saw uh, uh, your, your fellow man and he had a million dollars and you wanted it and you took it, that's not evil because it's an amoral world. There is no good. There is no evil. And we could, you know, we could flesh that out and talk about that. And, but that, you know, that would not be a good situation because basically it would become a, a place where only the strong survive. Another uh, thing that he could have done, he could have done these things. He could have done nothing. He could have created an amoral world where anything goes and there is no such thing as good or evil. Well, if there's no such thing as good, then he, how could he live in that world? Because he is good, okay? So, I mean, that, you know, that doesn't make sense. Uh, he could have created a world where we could only choose good. And then we would basically be robots. We would be robots. There was no choice. We could only do good. Or he could make it like he did where we have the choice. We can choose 
to, to love God or we can choose not to love God. We could choose to obey God or we could choose not to obey God. And evidently, this is the one that he chose and evidently this is the one that he thought was best because there's, there is the possibility that love could exist in this world. There is not a possibility of love existing in the other worlds. Because if, if, if we have no choice and we have to choose good, basically there, I mean, there basically is, I mean, you love God because he chose for you to love God. That's not good. I mean, <laughs> or if there is no good or evil, there's no love. But this is the world in which love could exist. So, uh, is evil the essence that remains in the absence of God? You know, in, in a way, that could be, we, we, could, we could see that, because basically where, where God defines he, made, he had to make the space for evil to exist, even though he's not evil. He doesn't create evil. But when he gave choice, we can choose to love. We can choose to be in a relationship with God, or we can choose not to. And we know that Adam and Eve chose not to. And when that happened, evil was manifest in humankind. So it, could it be that, that the space that God made for evil to exist had to do with the giving of human choice? And I think that's a good argument for, for that. Uh, we could do a lot of discussion about this. We could banter back and forth about certain things. But you know, the, the truth of the matter is we know that God did not create evil he allowed evil to happen, and will, will he deal with evil? He, he already has, and that's why Jesus had to come. That's why God had to come in the flesh to defeat evil. And the day will come where evil will be done away with, and say, well, well isn't that like us just choosing good? No, because listen... We make a choice to choose God and be in a relationship with Him. And what He will do when evil is, is done away with, He will seal that. And we'll live in essence in a, in a loving relationship with God throughout eternity where He will reveal His love to us and we will be able to love Him and be in relationship with Him throughout eternity with not the possibility of evil happening again. And that, I mean, I, that's as good an answer, Tammy, <laughs> that I can give for this. I, I know that this may open the room, Joe, for lots of discussion, but uh, there is, there's not a simple answer for this question. All right, let's move to the next one. I, I'm, I'm open for more discussion with this because I want to I learn as much as I can about things like this. Okay. If we are all born under sin, why was Jesus not born a sinner? That's not an easy one either. Jesus was born, we know that God was his father. Mary was his mother. Mary was a sinner. Now, I know that I, the, the, I don't understand all about Catholicism, but there, there's something known as the Immaculate Conception that that Mary was born without sin, otherwise, you know, that, and that, that kind of explains that, but <clears throat> there's, I don't see a scriptural basis for Mary not being of sin nature. So there, there are several thoughts on how we get our spirits and, uh, and how this could happen. One is called creationism, that at the moment of conception, God gives us our spirit. I think the problem that I have with this argument is that, so does he give us a sinful spirit? I can't see that. How can God give us something that is sinful when there is no sin in God? The, the next one is called transducian, transducism, which basically says that we inherit our spirits from our father and our mother. 
That's a possibility. That's, that's where, because we know that the Bible says that through one man's disobedience, all men became sinners. So that doesn't, that doesn't answer the question, how did Jesus not have a sin nature? Because a sinful mother and a sinless father. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Because did, would he not have gotten sin nature from his mother? Or some might think, okay, he had a sin nature, but he didn't act on that. He overcame that, even though he had a sin nature, he never sinned. Well, it, listen, if he had a sin nature, then he couldn't be the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay? So that, that, that one does not make sense to me. Another one is called preexistence, that we preexist. Before conception, that we have, we have, maybe we eternally preexisted, and, and there's some of the cults that, that basically uh, have this doctrine. Number one, there is, there is no uh, scriptural evidence that we preexisted, okay? There, there's not any at all. So that, that, that is not a good one. Then the, there's a, another thought that federal headship, because the Bible says that through one man's sin, Many were made sinners. It didn't say through the woman's sin. It said through the man's sin. So that the sin nature is passed through the father. That's a possibility. Uh, then th that kind of opens the door that, well, uh, Joseph was not Jesus' father. God was. And Mary was the mother. So therefore, that's how he was born without sin. Another one has to do with, with this thought, too. You remember when uh, uh, the angel came to Mary and said, You're chosen. You're going to have the Messiah. You're going to have the Son of God. He'll be the Son of God. And, it's, and it's, she said to him, Let it be unto me according to your word. That word is rhema. And the Bible says that we are born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God so she received the seed of the word of God into her which is incorruptible therefore whatever it comes in contact with cannot be corrupted and when this union took place uh, he received part from his mother but the incorruptible seed which is the word of God and we do know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that, there is that possibility that the incorruptible seed that was planted in the womb of Mary, he received his body from his mother, but he did not receive his nature from his mother because that seed could not be corrupted. Now which one is right? We don't know. But we do know this, that he did not have a sin nature. And God got it accomplished, and he didn't tell us how he did it. And, you know, there's, there's some things that the Scripture does not tell us, and we can speculate, and, we, and, and it's interesting talk. It's interesting theories, and, it, and it's all of that. But the thing that we do know is that Jesus was sinless, and he did not sin. And if Jesus was not sinless and he did not sin, could Jesus have sinned? Yes. He is the only one that could have corrupted it. He could have chosen to sin. Was he tempted to sin? The Bible says he was tempted in, in every manner that we are, yet without sin. The enemy came to him and tried to get him. He tempted him uh, in the wilderness with three different temptations at at Gethsemane, he was tempted to sin, even to the to to the under the stress that he that he uh, sweated drops of blood, resisting the sin, the temptation of not going to the cross, which was his purpose. So he did not sin; he did not have a sinful nature, and therefore he became the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Amen. That's as good answer as I can give on that. All right, popcorn time. All right. When I've got a little time. When God sent the flood but spared Noah and his family after the flood, he promised he would never destroy the earth like that again. Did God mean he wouldn't flood the whole earth or just parts of it? I've always wondered about that because all the floods that the rain brings all over the world. He promised that he would not destroy the whole world with water again. We do have floods and we do have destruction, but his promise was for the whole world. The next time that the earth will be destroyed, it will be destroyed by fire. Okay? All right. How can we say that Jesus entered into hell on our, on our account when he told the thief on the cross that on this day you'll be with me in paradise when our sins required that we go, that we go to hell and he took that payment on our account? <clears throat> there are several things about what happened in the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. We know his body was in the tomb, but where was his spirit? And it's kind of interesting, you remember on the cross that, that uh, the Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Many theologians think that when he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That at that point, he became sin. God turns his back on him, and he became sin with our sin. And one of the things that he said before he died is, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Well, one of the things that happened on the Day of Atonement, that the priest would place his hands on the head of the scapegoat and transfer the, the sins of the people onto the scapegoat. And the scapegoat would be taken into the wilderness where it would be, where it would be cut off. So we know that Jesus not only paid on the cross for our sins but afterward there were things that there was the judgment of God that came on him because of that now it's believed we here again we can't prove this that the many of the old testament saints when, when they died they didn't go directly to heaven but they went to the place called Abraham's bosom which was a compartment in the uh it was a place where they were protected. Yet they didn't go into heaven because the eternal price for their sins had not been paid yet. And that one of the things that Jesus did before he resurrected is that he went into Abraham's bosom and preached the gospel to them and then took them to heaven. So it's very possible that, here again, we don't have a lot of insight into this. We, just, we can just speculate a little bit about this that that when jesus said to the thief on the cross today you will be with me in paradise that he was talking about abraham's bosom and that before he went to to bear our sins that he took the the uh, thief on the cross to abraham's bosom and later came back and preached to them and led the bible says he led captivity captive that he took them emptied Abraham's bosom and took them into the presence of God and the Old Testament saints are in the presence of God now. So that's, that's how that could have happened. All right, here's another one. Do you think God still loves Lucifer? That's tough. Does God love Lucifer, who is Satan? Lucifer was one of the angels that God created, and God loved him. And I think God loves the being that he created, yet at the same time hates what he became. And he will not show grace towards Lucifer and eventually Lucifer will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So even though he loved Lucifer, he hates sin. And there is no redemption for Lucifer because Jesus didn't die for angels. He died for humans. Therefore, Lucifer will be condemned and cast into the lake 
of fire. Say, here's the next one. We're popcorning now, okay? Did God know about the COVID pandemic and when it would come? Absolutely. Absolutely. He knew about it. And uh, if God is all-knowing, then there's nothing that he does not know. God knows everything about you. He knows your thoughts before you think them. He knows your next sin. He knows your next action. He knows everything about you. See, here's, here's a neat thing about God that we don't realize. God lives outside of space and time and matter. And God sees eternity, past, present, and future, all at the same time. God can see your past as, as though it was happening. Your birth, you coming up, he can, he, can see, he can see all of that as if it is still happening, your present and even your future. So does God, is there anything that, that sneaks up on God? Absolutely not. And, you know, we could say, well, why did it happen? God does not always stop things that happen in our world. You, you think of all of the things that happen in our world. Some of those things have to do with people making choices and suffering the consequences of their choices, okay? Some things have to do with other things that we don't know the origin or anything like that. And God does not always stop those things from happening. But listen, God has a provision for us in those things, okay? So God, yes, God knew about the, the COVID pandemic and when it would come. Is there any mention of birth control in the Bible? Not that I'm aware of. Okay? I am not aware of. And, you know, I know, uh, and I don't know, and I'm not Catholic bashing, but I know that the Catholic Church, I don't know if they still are because I don't study Catholicism. I'm not being a critic of Catholicism, but they, don't they did not believe in birth control. And I, what they based that on, I do not know. But as far as I know, there is no mention of any kind of birth control, any regulations about birth control in the Bible. Now, there's some incidents where uh, a, guy, a guy got in trouble, and this had to do with the Leverett marriage situation of where his, his brother died, and, and, and the Leverett mar marriage situation is if, if a guy dies and is doesn't have seed that the brother takes the wife and has uh, has relations with her and that firstborn child becomes the heir of the of the deceased and this brother instead of when he had relations with her spilt his seed on the ground instead of doing what he was supposed to and God was angry and and killed him but that has nothing to do with birth control that has to do with disobedience okay uh, did I get there no okay do certain things change the plans God has for us example accidents no God knows everything that is going to happen okay he knows everything that is going to happen before it happens he knows people that will die by accident does that change his plan no, it does not change his plan at all because God, God is going to work his plan. He's going to work his overall plan, uh, and, and he, he probably, I'm not speaking for God, but, but you know, he's smart enough to, to see that this is going to happen, and that's not going to keep what he has planned for that person to happen because that's probably incorporated. Not that he causes that, but he sees that, and he works through that, Okay. So, no, we don't, we don't stop God's plan at all. All right, here's another one. If Adam and Eve were the first people, then where do the different races come from? They come from Adam and Eve. <laughs> if they, they were the only two people in the earth, then within their DNA... 
there was the different races. Uh, some things may have happened through, okay, you don't throw rocks at me, through evolution. Not, not uh, Darwin's evolution, but by, ad by adapting to environment. You know, there, there is evolution within species, okay? Uh, there, is it micro or macro? Uh, I forget which is which. But one says that this species evolves into this species and this species evolves into... The, uh, no, that's, that's... But what happens within a, within a species, because of the environment they live in, they may have an evolution to be able to survive in that environment. But they don't become... Monkeys don't become people, Okay? So, yes. So the races probably were within the DNA of Adam and Eve. All right. Where do ghosts come from? There are no ghosts. I, I know some of you believe in ghosts, but there, are, there is no biblical evidence for ghosts. There are spirits. There are demonic spirits that can uh, imitate people, but they're, I mean, listen, wh when a person dies, they go to where they're going. They don't, they don't hang around and haunt. I know some folks says that if, you, if I die and you do this, I'm going to come back and haunt you. No, you're not. No, you're not. You don't have that kind of control. And, and uh, you go to where you're going, okay, when you die. There are no ghosts. There are spirits, but there are no ghosts. Is there purgatory? There is no biblical evidence for purgatory. None. If you break a commandment and are saved, what happens? Easy. You need to repent. <laughs> no, you don't go to hell because you break a commandment. But listen, <laughs> you, you need to repent. The Bible gives us grace that if we, if we sin and we confess our sin, that He is faithful and just to forgive us our, of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So now, should we just sin and repent and sin and repent? No, that's not repent. Repent has to do with a change of mind and a change of heart. And if you, if you sin and forgive me for about what I'm about to do, I don't think that's repentance, okay? I'm, think, I'm thinking that you're, uh, you know, a lot of people live by, they don't understand what repentance really is. Repentance is not being sorry. It's not regretting something. It's having a change of mind, and it is a work of the Spirit of God in our hearts. All right. How do, we, how do you think God will, re, will view a marriage performed by a pastor versus a JP judge or someone who is ordained online? I don't think it makes a lick of difference. You say, well, how can you say that? Because the vows that you make are between two people and God. Ordination, listen... Ordination is a man-made thing, okay? It's a man-made thing, whether it is an ordained minister, whether it is an online ordained minister, whether it's a judge or wh whatever, uh, all that's man-made stuff, okay? Now, do I encourage you to go buy a license and get married according to the state. And even if you're a Christian, why not, why not have it in a church with, your, with, with a minister? I think that's probably the best way. But listen, you're just as married. If, if, if a judge does it, or a JP, or a pastor, or even a jack leg online preacher, okay? You're just as married in the eyes of, of the state, but also when you make vows before God, you're more married. 
And, and, we, and this is one thing that pastors do. And maybe JPs don't do this, but listen. Before God, do you take. Make this vow before God and only to this person. Yes, that's binding. Okay? If a person is saved, why will, he be ju- will they be judged? Also, I've heard pastors preach about a mansion in heaven or a crown. If I'm in heaven, why does it matter how big my mansion is? Or why would I need more than one crown? Okay. All right. The, the judgment that for believers is not, a, is not the great white throne judgment that's, that comes at the end of the age. The judgments for believers is called the marriage supper of the Lamb or the Bema judgment, which has to do with our rewards. It's not you go to heaven and you go to hell. Okay, And the Bible talks about our, our works being judged by fire. And what this has to do with motive, why we do what we do, I will be judged on this work that I do here. And basically, uh, it will pass through the fire. And if I have a wrong motive for doing something, that will burn up and I will not have a reward for that. And uh, so it's a works judgment. It's not a heaven and hell judgment. And God will give out crowns for that. And I, you know, why, why do I need more than one crown? I'm thinking, why do I need a crown at all? But that's just, that's just something that God said he'd do. Now, what about the mansion? Uh, I have an opinion, okay? When, when I see mansions and castles and things like that, that's not something that... I want to live in. I think, in fact, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and the, ideal, the ideal in this is that there will be room for you. And what I think is that God will design your dwelling place in glory to something that fits you perfectly. It, I don't think that it's necessarily going to be this huge mansion with 40 rooms in it. Why do I need 40 rooms? I mean, I, I just I don't see that. And that's, that's my opinion. I think he's going to prepare a place for us. And when we walk into it and see it, we're going to think, yes, this is perfect. If a person is never allowed are subjected to the Word of God, can they be saved? That's a tough one. And this is the reason that God left this commission to the church is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. People need to hear the gospel. Now, there, and I, I got to be done in two minutes, okay? Praise team, come on up. There's something that's happening in the Arab world right now among the Muslims that they are having dreams and even visitations that gives them instructions to go to a particular place to see a particular person. And they, will, they are led to somebody that shares the gospel with them. And I say all that to say this. Is it possible for God to reveal himself to somebody, and, and there is this story of Samuel, what is his name? The, he was in Africa, and God revealed himself to him, and he got saved. And, I mean, he just revealed himself to him, who he was. And he got saved and, and found the Word of God later. Is that possible? Yes. God wants people to be saved. God wants people to be saved more than we want people to be saved. And... Uh, So God uses many means to get people to come to Christ. The number one means he uses is the body of Christ to share faith with other people. So is it possible? Yes. Is it unusual? 
Yes, it is unusual for that to happen, but it can happen. All things are possible with God. Amen? All right. I didn't get to all the questions, but I got to many as I could. Hope you enjoyed this series, and, and uh, if you want, we'll do it again next year. Is that, is that good? Okay. Pray, uh, prayer team, come. If you're here today and you need prayer for any reason, now you can come as we worship.